from the heart of Dubai, where tomorrow is being built today to the world. Welcome to the CTO Show with Mehmet. Here, we redefine technology and reimagine possibilities. With Mehmet, delve into the riveting realms of AI, cybersecurity, and digital technology. Experience the thrilling highs and lows of startups. Immerse yourself in the spirit of entrepreneurship and witness the future of business innovation being written in real time. Now, without further ado, let's tune in and explore the future. Hello and welcome back to a new episode of the CTO Show with Mehmet. Today, I'm very pleased joining me from London, Richard. Richard, uh, thank you very much for being on the show today. I like my guests to introduce themselves because I believe this is the best thing to do is to keep it for someone to introduce themselves. So, Richard, the stage is yours. That's kind, Mehmet. First, first of all, thanks for having me. I'm a big fan of the show. Um, big fan of the show. I think you guys are doing uh, some and, and bringing bringing interest to a lot of areas that uh, both cybersecurity and technology uh, should be should have been talking about years ago. Uh, thank you. Anyway, my name is Richard Hollis. I'm a, I'm a director in a company called uh, Risk Crew, where, as you said, uh, we're over in London. I'm an American. Um, so that, I, I don't know, I, I bring that up in terms of my perspective of the industry. Uh, but at the end of the day, Mehmet, uh, I'm an old dog. I've been doing this for over 30 years. Um, yeah, I'm, I don't know if I'm on camera, but my white hair alone should tell you that I've had a lot of, uh, I've been in the business a long time. Um, so I've got over 30 years of experience of doing things that are all process, not product, but process oriented, uh, like risk assessments, policies, procedures, uh, cybersecurity compliance, risk management, uh, all the way through the red teaming and business continuity, disaster recovery. So I'm one of these guys who believe that, you know, uh, in, in cybersecurity is, is all about process, not product. And in fact, cybersecurity is an oxymoron. There's no such thing as a secure computer. Never was, never will be. The, the game is to identify, minimize, and manage the threats to the computer. So it's, a, it's very much a process that uh, uh, position that I take to my profession. Uh, and I do this for clients. Uh, I, I, we run a consultancy here in London. We're small, uh, but we've got a lot of very sophisticated clients who understand uh, and apply cybersecurity. So we do everything, like I said, from pen testing to uh, structuring compliance programs for them. Um, I know, I guess, I, I, I think the only thing really worth bringing out is I've been doing it. I mean, I've, I'm, I'm, I, I've not been talking about it. I've rolled up my sleeves and actually come up and design solutions uh, for, for our clients. So it's not easy. I know that. Um, and I don't think that's openly acknowledged and discussed a lot in business to, today. Um, so that's the viewpoint. The, that's my perspective. That's what I bring to the table in terms of my uh, where I'm coming from, from this and all the discussions I have. Great. Thank you again, Richard, for, uh, you know, being here today. And I think, you know, we'll try as much as we can uh, together to dissect and discuss. And, you know, the reason I keep, uh, you know, talking about cybersecurity uh, because, and risks, by the way, which is, I, I know, like, it's an area where you focus also on because it's uh, not only responsibility of, like, one person or one company or one product. Like it's something that we need to keep talking about. I know like people might uh, feel bored of it and you know, are we, or we come to that, but let's start with something, you know, when I was preparing for the episode, um, I've seen something you, you, you mentioned is that like cybersecurity is not actually doing what it's supposed to do. So why you think, you know, this way and what led you actually to to reach to this uh, conclusion? Yeah. Okay. So I did say I've been doing this for thirty years. Um, Mehmet, I'm probably tired, probably a little cynical, um, but moreover, I'm coming to an age where I look back on my career and I, I I'd like to think I was a part of something that that, that made a difference. And uh, being in cybersecurity, from my mind, in technology, cybersecurity has been one of the sexiest places to be in the last twenty years. It just has everything's there that's that's you know that's that's where the attacks are that's where that's that's where the 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 edge of the sword is and so i've been on the and i've been on the front lines the, like i said designing cybersecurity you know solutions and 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 and, and uh, defense strategies for all kinds of clients and i'm not i i guess what i'm saying is i'm not particularly proud of what 
my industry has done, and I've been a part of that. I think we failed. Let me just say it simply, I think the cybersecurity industry has failed. It's failed to meet the challenges. And, and the industry, there's a lot of components to the industry from vendors to, you know, uh, to, to enterprises that buy the solutions. But at the end of the day, um, I think I was talking to you be, be, before, um, before the session. You know, it's, it, it's clear that year after year, the number of breaches just skyrocket. And year after year, everybody, every business I know of is spending more and more and more on cybersecurity. And, and yet, every year, the, the number of breaches. The last thing I heard, you know, that I think in the last seven years alone, we've lost over 16 billion personal records. That's twice the number of people walking around on the face of the planet today. We've already lost twice as many records as there are people on the, on the planet Earth. And I don't know that you could look at our industry and say we've done a good job. Not at all. It's just we haven't been fit for the task. And it's, it's odd because other industries like safety, fire life safety, for interest, you know, where businesses had to adopt a framework to identify, minimize, and manage risk. They've done it. They've done it very successfully. But we just can't seem to do it in cybersecurity. And anyway, I, so I feel the industry has failed. It's failed to meet the challenges of the threat landscape, of the threat actors, of the threats out there today. And there's a lot of reasons. But um, I don't know. If I had to take them in order, Mehmet, I'd say the number one reason is our vendors, uh, cybersecurity vendors, the, the products they sell us are not fit for purposes. They, they're not fit for, for what's out there on the threat landscape today. They sell us something, you know, we're always buying cybersecurity products that were, you know, maybe uh, applicable to this, the threat landscape two or three years ago, but they're not applicable now. And that's understandable. They they invest in you know an anti malware or a firewall or an intrusion detection system, and they've got to get their money back. So they're going to bring it to market and leave it to market and sell it on the market as cutting edge for until they recoup their their investment. I get it. They need to make a profit, but I think beyond. Uh, but I think that's a problem. Um, it, let me let me say it this way. You know, there's a lot of people who look at the pharmaceutical industry. And so mm -hmm. that large, large pharmaceuticals make a lot of money selling us symptoms for the, for our colds and our flus and our coughs and our sneezes and our sniffles, uh, you know, when, uh, and there's a lot of money to be made treating the symptoms rather than looking for the cure. You know, I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm talking about just the daily stuff. And I, I think that's part of the problem that, that our cybersecurity vendors are motivated by profit and they're, they sell us things that aren't, that are for symptoms. And there, yeah, if there was a cure, you'd have to ask themselves, you know, the, would they be very keen on bringing it to, bringing it to market? Here, here's, what, here's a better way to say it. Cybersecurity vendors profit from the insecurity of computing. That's a fact. The more insecure our computers are, the more money they make. And, and that oxymoron, that, that little conundrum, I don't think is recognized by buyers, by CTOs and CISOs out there who have a limited spend and have to have to buy something that's going to have a, uh, a a significant impact on reducing the threat to their business. And they're going out there, and they're I don't think they recognize that there's something in it for a cybersecurity vendor. The profit for a cybersecurity vendor is is a part is a part time fix. He wants a recurring he wants a client to come back to him next year and the year after that and the year after that and not wait for five or ten years to sell something else. So I think that's just, just that, that transactional nature between us and our, our cybersecurity vendors is part of the problem. The next thing is, frankly, the products just don't work. They're not fit for purpose. They're, 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 um, it's like they sell us knives to take to gunfights. They're the, 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 they're a step behind the threats. You know, they're selling us this, something for, you know, last year's threats or this summer's threats when clearly their, their responsibility to us should be to be a step ahead of the threats and be selling us something to keep us out of harm's way next year and the year after that and the year after that. So they're, 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 they sell us things that historically were a problem for us two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and frankly, they're ineffectual. They're, 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 they're not. They don't work. Let me give you, a, you know, I'm rambling now, uh, uh, but let me give you one, one, one of my easiest examples is sure. ransomware. Ransomware. What is yep. ransomware? Rans ransomware is malware. Uh, ransomware is malware. And if you're running an anti-malware solution and you're still getting ransomware, maybe, just maybe, you're running anti-malware that doesn't work. It's not fit for purpose. 
And it's, it's, it's strange to me that rant when we, everybody's hair is on fire, when they talk about ransomware, but why aren't we talking about, geez, I'm, we're getting ransomware and yet we're buying two and three and four. I've got clients that have upwards of four and five anti-malware solutions running on their systems and they're still getting ransomware. Why is it? Because ransomware was built on identifying, you know, malware signatures from last year, the year before that, the year before that. It's not up to date. It's never up to date. It's always in arrears. And yet we, we're not talking about, hey, we're getting ransomware and maybe, just maybe, our malware solutions aren't fit for purpose. We're not connecting yeah. the dots. We're not connecting dots. We're buying firewall that should deny, that should deny traffic through a certain port, and it doesn't. And we're not, we're not, we're not connecting the dots saying the firewall is not fair for purpose. We're buying intrusion detection systems that aren't identifying intrusions. And we don't say, Hey, wait a minute. Oh, why I, I'm, I'm buying an alarm system to tell me if somebody's breaking in my house and I've got burglars in my house and I, I, uh, maybe my alarm systems is the problem. You can't yeah. blame, blame the bad guys that they're getting better and better and better each year. No, our products are just stagnant. They're not. They're not, they don't work. They don't, they're not fit for purpose in my mind. And, and, and this is, a, again, why this sounds very cynical, Mehmet, this is of, oh, over the last 30 years. I'm waiting for us to get ahead of the game. I'm waiting us to be a step ahead of the threats rather than a step behind. And I'll, it looks like I'll be waiting for the rest of my career. Oh, like, uh, this is very, I would say, thought-provoking, Richard, I would call it, because for someone, I like to be, it's not on purpose because I want to please people, but I love to look at things in a logical way, right? So, um, because what you mentioned is logical. Now, I'm buying, to your point, uh, products for hundreds of thousands, even sometimes millions of dollars, or euros, pounds, whatever it is. And still, you know, despite this, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ransomware attacks. I'm getting data breaches. I'm getting... Now, before we go into these, because I'm very interested to discuss more about, you know, the vendor landscape with you, but you mentioned something about also, you know, having uh, the, the processes in place. So now someone might say, but hey, look, like there are plenty of frameworks. For example, there is the list framework, you know, there's like some even the standardization like the ISO 27001 and all this. So why also like these processes, they didn't, help us in, in getting into a better shape? Well, it, it's like a, it's like you go to a gym to get in better shape. And you're, if you have a trainer, he gives you a list of things to do you know, do some sit-ups, do some pull-ups, do some, you know, some of these exercises, they're exercises. And until, and you can do exercises. I've, you know, I've done a lot of sit-ups and I still don't, my stomach still doesn't look like that, you know, and it's the intensity. It's building that, that, that workout into a routine uh, of, of your daily life and not just going to the gym once a weekend thinking that you're going to stay in, stay in shape. So a framework's a framework's a framework in my mind. I, I love ISO 27001. I love NIST. I love these frameworks that says, hey, do you think of this to keep up the health of your security, the, the security health of your systems? I think it's a, a think list. I think it's a, a good way to look and understand holistically, if I need to get this business secure, there are things I need to do. Things I need to do in pe with my people, things I need to do with my process and things I do with in technology. And I think one of the unsung thing, one of the, one of the things that, in fact, the, the joys of these frameworks for me are to give you a more holistic view of where to put your resources. All right. And it's because, because everybody, everybody, when, when cybersecurity came along, it's, it's, it's relegated to, you know, the CTO, it's relegated to an IT security manager. It's seen as an IT, it's seen as a technology problem. And it's not a technology problem. There are three attack vectors, people, process, and technology. And when you just put all your all your security spend into technology, you're neglecting two out of three attack vectors for threat actors. You're neglecting your people, you're neglecting your process. And that's where we're doing. We're spending our money on one third of the problem in terms of our defense. And the and these frameworks, you know, these the ISO framework, the NIST framework, they remind us that it's you've got to take a more holistic view. But you've got to actually do the sit-ups, you've got to, you've got to do the exercise. It's a process. It's not a you never become secure. You get up every day and you do more sit-ups and you do more, you know, patch management and, you know, it, it, you got to keep your business healthy and every, and, and not a lot of people, a lot of people take out gym memberships, go a couple of times and, and never go back as we all know, because it's work. It's actually work to stay fit and it's actually work to stay, you know, to stay secure. 
um, it's it's a it's a regime. It's 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 something that's a repetitive process that you've got to you know integrate into your business processes, and that's not an easy thing to do. So I I think to, I, I I'm a big fan of them, but I understand they're hard to you know they're they're they are absolutely hard to apply. Yes, yeah, yeah. Now you mentioned something interesting also, uh, uh, Richard, like regarding you know how you know the technology vendors they approach this so for example one of the famous things we always hear whenever for example you know they, they were able someone were able to to bypass their technology like hey to your point these uh, bad actors are getting like more intelligent you know they are getting more sneaky you know they are they are having like zero day attacks you know, like how can how can we you know be be aware of a zero day attack and its name is zero day, so no one still knows about it, so it's in the wild, so nothing can be done. You know, and I'm asking this not to challenge, but actually, you know, and this is part we will relate later in another question. Like, do you think this is a I would say this is an excuse, a valid excuse for for the technology to to fail us? <laughs> Um, no, in fact, this is why I'm so disillusioned with security vendors. Uh, what's a zero day vulnerability? It's an unknown unknown, right? It's a it's a it's an error in a piece of code that allows unauthorized access or an authorized privilege or, or something. It's an unknown vulnerability. Okay, Mehmet, can you can you tell me how how a manufacturer of a security pro, pro, uh, product could have an unknown anything in something that they made themselves? How, well, you, you know, the problem is, the problem is security vendors do not pro, uh, practice security by design. They don't implement OWASP in, you know, when they're building the uh, codes for the firewall or the anti-malware solution. And and the problem is, you, you just put your finger on what the problem is. The problem is that, that you know, because our cybersecurity vendors don't practice something as simple and fundamental as security by design and do secure coding of their products before they sell them to us, their products have now become threat vectors. Solar Winds taught us that. Look at any major, here, do this right after this podcast, not before, go to Google and type in any one of the 20 top security vendors in our industry. And you know what you'll find? All, all top 20, all 20 of the leaders in our industry have had a breach of their own systems in the last 18 months. How right. is that possible? How is that possible? How is that possible RSA has a breach and loses their code? I thought RSA is a security vendor. Are they not practicing what they preach? Are they not using their own product to secure their systems? The, you know, we look to our security vendors to be leaders in our industry, and they're not. They, they're, they're, they're suffering from the same problems we are. They can't protect their own systems. And, they, and, and you got to ask yourself, so these are, not, these are not shepherds. They're sheep. They're as lost as we are. You know, they're struggling to protect their own systems, and, and, and yet they're selling us and making a lot of money doing so, selling us firewalls and anti-malware and anti-intrusion uh, you know, uh, uh, systems, and their, their own systems, their own business systems are constantly suffer breaches and have become. Now, so back to your, your point, because of their zero-day vulnerabilities, they have become backdoors because they're trusted products. We implement a firewall, we implement a, a anti-malware solution, and we trust it because it's got a big name of a cybersecurity vendor on it, and we trust it. But we don't, and we don't under, even understand or can, can consider that it has a backdoor because it was insecurely coded. So I'm sorry, I, you know, I don't believe this zero-day vulnerability. I don't. I, I think that when we use that term, it lets vendors off the hook for insecure. The manufacturing of their software. Okay, if you if any security vendor out there isn't practicing, and I mean religiously practicing, uh, OWASP and a secure development for a tool that you and I will put onto our systems to protect our data, then then shame on them. How, yeah, that's very hypocritical to me. Um, but Solar Winds taught us all: we can't trust vendors. You cannot trust a vendor product. You can't. And and honestly, before you go out and buy any product. Um, Use your go to Google, see if they've had their a breach of their own systems, and then ask them, how did that happen? Because you're selling me a product to protect my system. How did your system suffer a breach? Was your product involved? Were you not using your product? What you know, and uh, and of course the accountability, they, they, which is a completely different subject. If we buy these products and we have breaches, 
uh, you know, like I said, we buy anti-malware and we get ransomware. Why aren't we picking up the phone and calling the anti-malware and say, your, your, your anti-malware solution I bought from you doesn't work. I just got ransomware. I'd like my money back, please. There's no, there's no accountability in the consumer transaction between us and our cybersecurity vendors. So they do get away with selling us insecure code of a firewall, of an application, a web application firewall, because it wasn't built and suddenly it's a backdoor for a hacker. I don't think hackers are getting any more sophisticated. I just think our, our cybersecurity vendors aren't getting any more sophisticated. I don't think they're doing their job. Yeah. So, but maybe they would say, like, this is the nature of how all uh, computer software works. So you always have to keep, you know, do testing, you know, when you release new, um, when you release new features, for example, like they, they, someone might say this, but I believe, Richard, to your point, now that's fine, you know, for me, at least I'm, I'm telling you my opinion, but what, and sorry for if it's a strong word, but what iterate me, you know, like what feels me really angry when any vendor, you know, claims that if you deploy their solution, you're going to have the 100% peace of mind, which is, we know it's, it will not. So how, how, you know, the marketing factor, because you mentioned, yeah, of course, every business has the right to make profit. Like we, no one can argue on this. But I mean, the transparency, do you think that there's a play on the wording sometimes? And I'm going to bring one term which became very mainstream in the past 18, 24 months, zero trust, for example, right? So, and secure by design. So, can, like, do, do you think they are exaggerating, you know, these terms in a way that we, as an end user, as, as a, as a, business, um, you know, line of business or decision maker in the IT or the security department say, hey, look at these guys, they are saying this, secure by design, zero trust, okay, I, I can trust them. Do you think like there is an exaggeration in the terms that they are using? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, I pointed out to all of us, we weren't using that term zero trust, which is overtaken, which is just so popular in our industry now, prior to solar winds. Solar winds made us all understand that products and cybersecurity products, the more trusted they are, the more of a target they become. Uh, and so we need to not trust these things. And so we, we started to question vendors and we started to use terms like zero trust. Now, what you're, what you're saying is what I've said for 30 years, if it's not in your service level agreement, the vendor is not going to be accountable for it. So go to your service level agree, agreement for that product that you're buying, whether it's a managed cybersecurity security product or a or a, just a, just a piece of hardware or software. Go to the service level agreement in terms of maintenance and management, and 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 look for any kind of a liability if in the event that it doesn't work, in the event that it it doesn't stop a you know a, a certain type of traffic from entering through the port of that firewall, or it doesn't identify a malware signature of a certain application, you're not going to find it. There are no absolutes. There are no guarantees. There absolutely are no guarantees in any product service level agreement we find out there in our cybersecurity vendors. Now, those are the ones I'm worried about, not the rest of the industry. Yeah, of course, I get it. You know, we're, we're, we're developing applications that are not secure. I get it. There's money to be made. We got to bring it to, to, to market quickly. And there's money, you know, and, and quickly means cash. So the quicker we bring something in the market, the more money it can make. I get it. So we, what do we do? We overlook security. We always have, we always will. I get it. But that does not forgive our cybersecurity vendors. You see, these, these, this area of our industry should be above and set, set the example. They should be the leaders. If anybody should be practicing security by design, it's a cyber, it's a cybersecurity product vendor, hardware, software, managed service. I don't care what it is. If they're not mm -hmm. following a WASP and doing secure development uh, uh, and penetration testing of the product, I've never, I've never met a, a product vendor that will allow me to do a pen test on their product. And I think, well, then give me your pen test report. Well, we can't do that. Well, do you do them? Well, that's why you can't do it because they're not even pen testing their own product They're that they're going to sell me that I'm going to attach to my systems to protect my data. So two things. One, we absolutely started, you know, the prevalence of the term uh, zero trust comes from our vendors. We can't trust our vendors. They are attack vectors. They are attack vectors. And clearly, whether that's in the supply chain or in the, you know, hanging off our firewalls, 
our tech, our products and services that we depend on have become attack vectors. And they've done that because the whole market as a whole uh, rewards speed over security, but that shouldn't apply to our cybersecurity vendors. They should be secure over speed. And because we're buying it for security, we're not buying it because it's quickly on the market, you know, and I pay more for that. I pay more for a cybersecurity product that actually didn't have zero day vulnerabilities as, and was, was, you know, uh, the, the code was, was not uh, uh, open source and had all these back doors and holes in it. I would pay more for that development of, of the product uh, because I need to depend on that product because it's got the word, yeah, because I'm using it as a, as a, as a measure, as a control that I'm putting on to minimize the risk to my, to the rest of the applications that are built in securely. So if we can't count on our vendors to do it right, who can we count on? And, and, and this whole topic is under a certain, you know, what's wrong with the market. The market is we're not providing the leadership in our own industry by setting the example for all vendors to practice secure by design. Yeah, and I think one of the things that they mentioned always, Richard, that I think even, you know, even I've heard CISOs mentioning this, surprisingly, is, okay, the weakest link is always the user. Because you mentioned three pillars, right? So you mentioned technology processes and, and you know, the employees, right? So now there are tools, there are programs for training, uh, you know, staff, on, on, you know, how to have the cyber hygiene. Do you think, you know, we didn't also do the right job of training, you know, people on, on, on having a true high, uh, you know, uh, cyber hygiene. And uh, this is maybe brings back to the point, like someone might argue, okay, I'm, I'm fine to be trained, but sometimes I have to click that link because for example, it's like part of a biggest social engineering attack and, you know, like. I have to click because it's coming like from the CEO or coming from, you know, a, a, a VIP in the company. And I've heard this. Okay. I did the mistake and I clicked a link, right? I did that. Are we to be supposed to have the technology to detect, you know, by email if the link is malicious, right? <laughs> so it, it's like a chicken and egg thing always. And, you know, what, what you can tell me about that, Richard? I can just tell you, you're absolutely correct, but that's, you know, we've been doing this for 30 years now, 30 years we've been in this industry. It's not young anymore. And as I said, we all recognize if, if you, if you understand cybersecurity, there's three attack vectors through people, through process, through technology. All right. Do you know, Mehmet, do you know any company that spends their security budget evenly between those three, three vectors? No. Do they spend one third on technology, one third on process, and one third on their people? No, they don't. They don't. And this is this is so I I I, I hear it. The user is the weakest link. Yes. Okay. So let's do something about it. How about taking one third of your budget and allocating it to user training, or process and backup and 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 business continuity and disaster recovery and re re resiliency training? And, and, but no, no. We spend it on on kit. We spend it on hardware and software. Uh, it, it's a product to us. Uh, so it, it's this until we open up our perspective and understand the game is to look at all three attack vectors and treat them equally. And until we do, uh, we will always have, you know, a, a weaker link. And we'd love to say the user is a weaker link. Well, here's, here's an idea. Let's spend some money on that problem then. Okay. Let's stop putting our money in the firewalls and the antivirus that doesn't work that anti-malware that doesn't work because we're still getting ransomware. And let's, let's start spending on training our users. And we don't, I don't know of any large, small, medium-sized business that looks at the user as one third of their security budget. They don't, they never did. And, and, and that's to me, the problem that we don't understand. We, you know, we know, we know the three attack vectors, but we spend money on just looking at the one and trying to minimize the risk through our technology. And that, and, and until we take a more holistic view and apply our budgets across all three equally, I don't see how we're going to see any advances. Um, and blaming the user is is a way out, for instance. You know, I, 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 I talk to our C, to CISOs who are spending 100 million whatever's in, you know, of, of their budget on technology and, you know, five 5,000, you know, Dollars, whatever, on on, on a, uh, on a computer-based training for you know their users, 
And I, th I think, well, you're spending 100 times your budget. You know, 1% of your budget goes to your people. And that's canned security awareness training. And how do you expect, how do you expect these, you know, us to change behavior uh, uh, by just put in, having somebody sit down and watch 30 minutes worth of, you know, oh, change your password. Oh, you know, don't click on unknown links. Oh, thanks. That's, 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 new, work. that's new information. Hadn't heard that in the last 30 years. But I tell you, if, if vendors were making money in selling information security awareness, really good, we'd get some really cool, very cutting edge, brand new approach to this. But there's no money in it. There's no money in any in security awareness training other than selling, a, 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 you know, some canned uh, computer-based training. So we're part of the problem, is what I'm saying. I mean, you know, it's you know, vendors are going to sell us with how we're in areas that they make money. Maybe if we started paying more attention to our process, our business processes, and our people, uh, we we start to see new solutions that are more effective and can change the needle uh, on on how many times users will click on a link. Until then, let's stop beating them, beating them up, and take a little of the responsibility until we start paying for their training uh, and educating them. Uh, really educating them and changing the culture of the company, and then shame on us. We're blowing our money on technology, and we always, that doesn't work, by the way. So uh, it, it's, we're ultimately caught in this circle, this self defeating circle. We, we, we don't have a strategy to, 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 to address all three attack vectors people, process, and technology. We spend it all on technology. The technology doesn't work. So what do we do? We go out and buy more technology. Oh, I got a breach in a firewall. Well, okay, well, we'll get this next gen firewall. And then we do that, we spend more money and that firewall doesn't work. And meanwhile, our people keep clicking on links and our processes, our backups keep getting stolen. And, and, and we, because we neglect uh, paying attention and putting effective controls into those, into those two other attack vectors. And we just keep, we go around the circle and we buy more product uh, uh, that doesn't work. We get breached again. And so what do we do? We run out and we freak out to, we, oh, we got breached. We'll go out and buy more, more product. Um, so the, it, it, to me, this is where we've been for the last 10, 15 years. The first 10 years of any industry, sure, we're trying to figure out what's going on, but we get this now. We understand how to, how to reduce the risk of a breach. We know that. And there are frameworks from NIST to ISO, which we talked about, that will, will give us a holistic view of how to reduce the breach. But we still are thinking technology is our answer technology and and here's a security vendor who's going to sell me this new sexy product uh, let me just buy this check that box and move on meanwhile some users you know clicking on a link and you get yet another piece of malware and because your malware malware doesn't work you're right back where you started yeah so let's let's come to to the second of this let's say we discussed people to the third one which is the processes and i'm a big fan of risk mitigation i talked about risk mitigation a lot you know, in, in my, when I was a, a consultant and the issue there, to be fair, Richard, as well, I think what, if I can claim what, I don't want to use the word failed, but what we were not able to highlight enough to the board, the business decision makers, the importance of giving attention to risk mitigation. And I am someone who, who work in the areas of disaster recovery, business continuity, you know, and all this stuff. And again, it was always seen, and I'm not sure if you would agree with me, it's again, it's because of the vendors maybe, or maybe some of the, the way we used to do consultancies, it was seen as you know what, like this is a cost that it's not needed now. So let's think about it when it happens, right? So have we failed to educate the business about all these processes and why they are very much needed? I, I'm really beginning to sound very cynical. I think the failure lies with us as professionals. And I point the finger at myself, Mehmet. I think, you know, when I was in school, I hate to do the long division. You know, to actually calculate, you know, so, and, and for me, when we talk about process in a business, we talk about more of the fundamental that you just uh, mentioned, I'm doing a risk assessment. Risk assessments mm -hmm. are the, is the fundamental building block of everything you do in your cybersecurity program. And a CISO is so far removed from a 
doing, rolling up his or her sleeves and doing a hands-on risk assessment, identifying, you know, identifying what's the asset, what's the value, what's the criticality of that asset, what's the location, who's the owner, what are the risks to that? What are the, what's the impact probability, the likelihood probability? What is the you know, what is the inherent risk? And if I add this control, what's the residual risk? That long division. On one line for one asset in you know uh, in one piece of technology is rarely done to the degree that it must be done. Much less for every new project, for every new web application, or every new uh, acquisition or sale. Uh, you know, risk assessments are the the fundamental element. You know, uh, of of all of our cybersecurity, and yet. I've you, you you can tell me if you've if you've seen them done right, uh, and and seen them done and used as a tool to actually identify, minimize, and manage the risk to that business. And it's it's like we don't want to actually do the long division and calculate everything because that's a lot of you, you know how long it takes to do a good risk assessment for a business for for a multi, much less a multi million dollar business located in you know a multinational multi million dollar business much less just a, just a florist you know mom and pop dot com selling flowers online to do a risk assessment so what are my assets where are they located what are the threats what are the probabilities of those threats happening and so we neglect the process the fundamental process that that drives our business and we we neglect that in favor of going out to buy a product or a solution. And just assuming that we understand the risk to that to to that information asset. So for, for me, it's a it's a question of we've got CISOs out there who are not putting their arms around, embracing, um, uh, and and actually doing you know on a granular level, on a micro level, an information security risk assessment, you know where it needs to be done, uh, both on a on the whole enterprise and on new projects or supply chains or, you know, new things as the business is evolving. It's a hard thing to do um, and to do it, also to do it right. And then recommend the control that's actually going to minimize or mitigate uh, uh, the risk. And so I think we're not, we've never sold that to the board to, to answer the second part of your question. We have to understand what the risk is to sell it to the board, to articulate it to the board, to articulate the benefits for reducing that risk or transferring that risk, articulate it to the board. We, we, we've we've never done that. I don't know of a CISO who's actually, he has somebody else doing the, uh, and feeding him uh, a risk treatment plan for review and approval, but they're not actually doing it themselves. It's like until you build the house yourself, you don't, you know, you don't understand every single brick that needs to go in it uh, to make you feel secure enough uh, uh, to, to, to say, this is the dwelling that we want to live in and sell that, you know, that idea to the board. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just a, it's just a, for, for me, risk assessments are the, are, are the key, yeah, the key to everything. Because as I said, for me, uh, cybersecurity, oxymoron, cybersecurity is, 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 is a process it's, and the process is risk management. And if we're not doing our risk assessments, uh, a, a fundamental part and integrating that into our business processes, how can we ever bring the board on, uh, the board uh, up to date and win their hearts and minds uh, about what the risks are to the business and why we need to do something about it. Yeah. Now, to this point, maybe because I've talked to some CISOs as well, and, you know, sometimes they say that the priority is to keep the lights on, as they say. So, for example, if they are in a retail, you know, we need we need to make sure that, you know, there's zero downtime for our uh, post systems and, you know, the, the e-commerce but um, they understand that, but they say, you know, like the priority always is given for anything that touch, you know, the, the, the core business, right? Now, some of them, they mentioned, look, I understand what you're saying, but I don't have the manpower to help me in this, right? And some others, especially we start to hear about this issue recently in cybersecurity, like we have lack of skills as well. Now, with that mentioned, uh, Richard, like, how do you think, you know, we, we can do a better job in order to, without compromising what we just mentioned, like, okay, keep investing in, in technology. And you mentioned, like, you can divide the budget over three. But I mean, there are some other factors, which is like, you know, the time to do this, because they have other initiatives and, you know, the, the manpower to do that. <laughs> 
I don't have a, a really, you know, I, I, there's not a silver bullet here. But I will tell you this. I, I find it odd that, uh, you know, we do have a, a severe shortage of skilled people in the market, right? Why is that? That is because the market hasn't asked for skilled people up until now. And when we have asked, there's nobody there. Because in the last 30 years, we have not made cybersecurity a marketable profession. And meaning a business needs that element in their business to be successful. So we're all coming to grips with, no, the business is kind of concerned with cybersecurity. Let's go find a CISO or a or an information security and compliance manager out on the market. And you know what? There's no, not a lot of people out there with this kind of experience. You know why? Because we haven't asked for them 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So, you know, part of it, part of this is, you know, we're all, we're all thirsty now and there's no water uh, to quench our thirst, but, you know, sorry, this is not, this, this cybersecurity problem did not happen overnight. And it is a problem. It is a problem. When you go out and look for a skilled plumber or, or electrician or carpenter, and you don't find one, uh, that's because, you know, the market wasn't asking for them up until now. All right. So that's got to, to fix that problem 10 years, 15 years, 20 years from now, we need to start right now investing in understanding and, and taking on. So taking on uh, people with minimal talent and training them within. To me, that's that's what I'm doing. I'm a I'm a cybersecurity uh, consultancy, and I'm I was hiring good people is one of my hardest things. But I hire bright people, and they pick it up very quickly. Um, and you know, to, for us to so I have my own solution. Every company's trying to adopt a solution to deal with a marketing you know a shortage of resources out there. Having said that, you know it's our fault. It's our fault. Yeah. It's our it's our fault. We weren't looking for these people, and they weren't in school. You know, to help them make the decision five years ago. Um, I don't. It's a temporary problem in my mind. That's a good news because now you know everybody in cybersecurity seems to be, in my mind, overpaid for what they're doing uh, uh, and what their qualifications are. Uh, people getting out of school with you know virtually no uh, experience, hands-on skills and experience, or making incredible sums of money because they have a, a, you know, a degree, that doesn't mean they're capable for the job. So even the resources that we do, you know, we can say, oh, there's a cybersecurity resource. That doesn't mean they're very good. That just means they, they you know, they just got a sort of uh, ethical hacking certification. Uh, you know, that doesn't mean they have any experience in breaking into si sensitive systems. Uh, um, that just means they, they're, they, they're in a place to start, to learn. Uh, it's a tough problem. It, it, it really is, but it's come through neglect, our own neglect. You know, how can we blame the market? It's our, it's the businesses that haven't looked for this uh, and, and required it from the market that are, you know, are to blame. So uh, in the meantime, we got to take care of ourselves. It's like physician heal thyself. Uh, and uh, yeah, I've always been an advocate of, you know, what they call, used to call 30 years ago, the human firewall. Everybody's responsible for cyber in this company. All we need to do is get a leadership is get leadership to, to communicate everybody's responsibilities. And everybody can equally tear it down this year. We don't need a cybersecurity department. We need employees that are cybersecurity aware. We need a board that puts money behind cybersecurity, you know, controls. Uh, it, it's, and and that's, that's, that's a leader. And, I, and that, of course, I, I do feel we are short of leaders who can articulate a way forward and blame it on, oh, we don't have anybody in the IT department who knows firewalls. Really? Yeah. Yeah, that's what they say. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is, and we end up. Funnily enough, we end up blaming the technology that we buy to protect the, uh, you know, the our IT systems. It's 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 an odd thing. But I am part of you know big groups and you know who are struggling with this. Yeah, there are underqualified people out there. But in my mind, that doesn't mean we don't do anything right now, right here and now. Uh, you, you've every business I've ever worked with has some incredibly talented people, and if they were sat down and said, "You know what you could do to help the cybersecurity of this program X, Y, Z," um, and 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 pay them more, you know, and rather than hire a you know hire a whole de uh, department. Um, but for me, let, let me just back up. The most important, if I if I could if I could fix this problem, I'd start with secure coders to start generating secure applications that would. Re reduce the level of our pain so significantly that the rest of us could take a breather because that in, in terms of, you know, I'm not looking for under, under skilled. I, the problem isn't under skilled CISOs or IT security managers. The 
problem year after year after year is we keep releasing code that's insecure with, as you mentioned, zero day vulnerabilities. Shame on us. We just, we're just, we're just raising the floodwaters around us. Yeah. Now uh, it's some, something everyone in cybersecurity also, they jumped on it, I would say, and everyone is mentioning AI and how AI would be able to help. Do you think really AI can help in fixing not the full problem, but partially maybe? I, I'm an old guy. <laughs> how many times have I said this during this chat? I'm an old guy. AI, I've been looking at it for three, four, five years now. And um, forget all the science fiction that I've, I've written. But I've also seen, I've also seen uh, threat you know, and our response to it. And what I've come to believe is, is AI is, will be, for me, a double-edged sword. Can it be used for attacks? Absolutely. I've seen it. I'm seeing it now. Whether that's chat GPT phishing or, you know, uh, and, and how evolved and sophisticated AI attacks will be and AI tech defense. So it's like that, um, you know, uh, that yin and yang. There will be a, a huge rise in AI in the use by, you know, and its use by threat actors in very specific threat vectors. Absolutely. Now, can we rise to that challenge and manufacture AI products that can produce controls, can anticipate AI attacks uh, and, and, and respond to those? Maybe, but there's, there, that doesn't mean th this war will just be between two AI actors fighting it out f for each other. You know, for, for me, with every new threat, there's a control that has a limited impact and it just, the, the balance goes forward. It's always been something in my lifetime it has always been something it has been technology first security second you know wi-fi everybody adapted wi-fi and they went oh wait wait 802 wi-fi is insecure uh, okay um cloud cloud comes around oh wait a minute like cloud so easy what great technology oh, wait a minute it's insecure it, we it's always technology first um uh, security second so Technology first, here, come, here comes AI. It will, and it is currently being used as a very effective tool, uh, attack uh, tool. And it can be and will be, I'd like to think, used as a very effective defensive measure. Um, but that fight for me doesn't mean things are going to change significantly uh, in terms of you know threat and threat response. Uh, it'll change the conversation. It'll change what CISOs and CTOs are talking about for the next five years. But it's just another weapon and shield, you know, uh, and what the, made from the same technology, you know, with the same technology base, which uh, will be interesting. Um, but um, I don't see a resolution. I don't see one victor on one side or the other yet. Yeah, I agree with you. And by the way, like, um, and thank you for for you know mentioning this to Richard. We meet to, to me, Richard, before we we started the session, like you. You were hearing some of the old episodes where I used to be by myself. And, you know, one, on one episode, I, I, I did a rant, <laughs> you know, and I said, if, if, <clears throat> if a vendor, whether cybersecurity or other vendor, is coming and telling you, hey, I have AI-powered, machine learning-powered, you know, product, the first thing you should do, you know, and go and ask, okay, what kind of machine learning is it doing? Like, what kind of AI is it? Because, honestly, I was a sales guy. You know, and, and people see me till now as a sales guy, but I hate to use mimics just for the sake of using the mimics inside our gimmicks, let's say, inside my pitch. Of course, like if I have a good product, I would pitch this product in the best way, but I love to give people a sense, you know, if I'm using a piece of technology. So if I'm using AI, really, I would love to give them first, what kind of AI I'm using? Because AI is not chat GPT, of course, <laughs> it's only like it has many things in the background. And second, you know, what I'm trying to achieve with this, and to your point, and I think, you know, which is not surprising to me, and I think it's not surprising to you, that the bad actors are more, I would say, advanced in using AI because they don't have to go and waste time in thinking how we're going to market this. <laughs> because they are already yeah. themselves, right? So mm -hmm. now one of my guests, like, uh, I hope he's still listening to me, Karim uh, Hijazi. Once he mentioned to me, and I want to, uh, to take your option, your opinion on this. He, he said, it's not only about, like, we spend a lot of, of money on, on the technologies. He, he said, 
We spent a lot of money actually on defensive technologies while we should have spent also on offensive technologies. Do you think also like this is something which is underrated? I do. I really do. I think you made a really good point. I, I don't understand. You know, for me, the internet is a, you know, I'm an American. It's like the Wild West. You know, the, the law on the internet is anybody who's powerful, whether that's, you know, in a consumer size, whether that's Google or, 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 you know, or, or Meta or, or Jeff Bezos or Amazon, you know, for, for me, might is right on the internet. And, and I am, I've always been shocked. There is no, there is no police force. There's no intergovernmental, you know, there's, 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 there's law enforcement chasing down bad pedophiles and things and you know okay there's a there's an element and of course every government on the planet uses the internet for surveillance um but outside of that there is absolutely no framework of right and wrong of good and bad of 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 legal and illegal activity on the web and then and i cannot believe i cannot believe that we haven't taken a more offensive uh strategy to our web you want to, you want to, you know, launch a denial of service attack against my, uh, my business at a very crucial time, you know, a business, uh, that I turn around and take your IP address and blow it off the face of the planet kind of thing. I just don't understand how we haven't gotten more proactive in our security defenses. I don't, I don't get it when there's literally nobody who would stop us doing that. Um, I, 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 that proactive defense and that proactive security um, and oh, now what I did see, interestingly enough, remember when we went from IDS intrusion detection system to an IPS intrusion prevention? Uh, you know that technology came from an area of the world who was very offensive, uh, and and I thought, okay, this is great. We're changing, we're changing the way that that we go. But I, I, I other than that, I I just don't see how uh, how every business who you know we can see who's 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 scanning our firewalls or reading our logs or, you know, we, we, we can see that it's, it's transparent on the web and whether it's by, I'm sure it might be by proxy. Uh, it might not be a direct, but we could trace that down and we could, we could do the same thing and launch and be very proactive in inter intercepting that traffic and derailing that traffic. And, and I'll say it, turning that traffic around and putting it right back at the, the target that sent it. I don't, I don't get, it. I'm all for that, by the way, because, you know, nobody else is looking after, you know, it's not like we've, we've got, you know, our world governments come together and launch a treaty that we're going to extradite hackers from, you know, Russia or, or this state, nation state, or that nation state. Nation states are one of the biggest offenders and threat actors, you know, on the, on the landscape today. So they're part of the problem. And given that, I don't understand how everybody's just on, you know, say you connect to the web. There are no promises. You do what you have to do to protect your business. Right. Right. Um, you know, I, 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 you said like, you don't think we're going to see a solution in, 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 in your care, you know, career life, uh, Richard. And I don't think also I would see it's like a mouse and cat, uh, game that we, people have to play hopefully and not, you know, you know, still, I like to be on the optimistic side. How? I don't know. I have no answer how it, it will be. But I believe, you know, at some point, you know, people will become, and when I say people like CISOs and CTOs and, you know, uh, technology and cybersecurity professionals, they will say, you know what, enough is enough. Like We've got enough of this. And, you know, like we, we, we need to do something about it because it's causing people fatigue. It's causing people stress. It's, it's, as you mentioned to your point about the number of records, which was, you know, lost, right? So, and then here we go, our lives became digital. Everything we rely on, on, on systems and we cannot, we cannot go like forever like this. And I agree with you on this. So let's hope that one day, very, in the very near future, we'll see a solution for this, right? Um, so Richard, where, where, Tell me, like, what kind of services you offer, and where people can can find more about you. So the company is called Risk Crew. Uh, if our website's riskcrew.com, and uh, we do all these product agnostic services that we've been talking about, which is why I have a, such a strong opinion, obviously, from risk assessments, policies, you know, compliance, GRC compliance programs to ISO and and NIST and and these these uh, these uh, best practices. 
as well as things like SOC 2 and, and uh, GDPR and whatnot. Uh, and then move through to penetration testing, uh, you know, web app pen test. We do really interesting red team testing, which is, which is a lot of fun. Um, all the way to business continuity, disaster recovery, best practices based on open source, based on, you know, cost effective, what's right for the business uh, kind of thing we believe in, like I said, process over product. Um, uh, and been in business for about 20 years, having a good time. It's still fun, although, you know, pardon the cynicism in my, in my views, uh, I, I'd like to see a lot more change in our industry. Um, can I, can I just say, yeah, cause I'm interested in how you, you were bringing us to the, you know, will, will, you know, what I'd like to see Mehmet and the you know, professional objectives aside, I think we all need to start taking cybersecurity a lot more personal. You know, we've, we approached it as a data security, ones and zeros, ones and zeros, ones and zeros. And this is not about protecting ones and zeros. This is about protecting data about people's lives, about somebody's mother or father or children or brother or sister. These are people's lives. We're losing this data on people's lives and, you know, medical records. And, 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 and I, I, you know, I don't care if it's, if it's what kind of shampoo you use for your hair. It's, this is personal data. This is data about people's lives. And I think fundamentally our problem is I, my problem in my industry in my cybersecurity industry is I meet other cybersecurity professionals and they don't take it personally. They don't, it's not personal. It's just, it's a job. And, and, and for me, this is very much of, you know, a, a fundamental issue of personal privacy and, and your expectations. And that if you expect, to, if you give your data to a company, your natural expectation is they'll look after it as if they were looking after their own data. And yet I don't see that. I don't see that in the CTOs and CISOs that I talk to. For one of the first questions is, I, is your personal data in this business system? And they look at me and say, what, are you kidding me? And I think, well, if, if you know, because that's the way you should try treat the protection of all systems as if it had your most secret details on them and you would expect a level of privacy of that computer or that system and and i don't i don't think we do and i i i see a lack of taking this personal uh we take it professional and we do it for you know till from nine to five then we go home and we we spend time with our kids then we come back and you know our threat actors don't do that they don't work a nine to five gig they're 24 7 you know uh seven days a week this is a lifestyle for them uh, but they don't what I'm saying is I don't, I don't think we make the personal connection between ones and zeros and actually we're losing data day after day about people's lives. Shame on us. Yeah. Like, uh, it's again, a, another thought provoking sentence you just mentioned, Richard, we should take it more, um, personal, which is true. And, you know, again, like exactly, I think one year and three months or one year or a half, let's say. Back then, I did a couple of like videos where I was just talking about this, and I was saying, "Look, imagine you know you have a relative. I don't want to make it very personal, but you have a relative in the hospital, and all of a sudden, you know, the the X-ray machines, you know, you cannot process the data out of of you know the the, the, the what you call it the EHR system or the medical record system. You can you you can you are you know sitting on in a in a place and you get stuck because the systems are not working." due to a malware, ransomware, whatever it is. So it's, it's like about real, real use case scenarios. And it's not like, but again, to, to your point, Richard, uh, yeah, I blame, I blame not all of them for me, but I blame some of the vendors and I blame their messaging because, you know, they, they cause this. So they cause this and people start to think even, you know, like if, if, you, if I tell you some of the conspiracy theories that came out because of this, hey, you know what? Yeah, these antivirus companies, they keep releasing the viruses, so we keep buying it that from us. Like, you know. <laughs> so who's to blame there? But that's a good point. Who's to blame? I mean, I, I know I sounded like I'm blaming the vendors, I, but let me back up and say, you know who I blame? I blame the buyers. I blame the buyers. You get what you pay for. And maybe, just maybe, if, if, if people who bought cybersecurity products started to expect more and then started to demand more, that we get a change in the industry. Cybersecurity vendors sell us products that don't work, that's my opinion, because we buy them. If we stopped buying them, if we asked for accountability and said, I'll buy this, but if I have a breach, you'll give me my money back. If we started to exercise basic consumer rights that we do in every other industry, 
I, 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 every other industry that I know of, people buy a flat screen TV, they take it home, it doesn't work, they take it back to the where they bought it. This does not work. If we did that in our own industry, we'd start to affect real change. So I'll, I just want to be very clear. I don't blame vendors for selling us products that don't work, don't like it, but I blame, I blame the people who keep buying them year after year after year. That's, that's the source of change for me. That's the way to change the needle is to start to expect and demand more from our vendors. Yeah. So again, uh, I, I would love to hear, you know, you know, feedbacks about this from the audience, because you know, it's a very hot topic. Uh, I hope that <laughs> I have a lot of friends working on both sides. So guys, like, uh, you know, you can just tell me that this is an open space. I'll send your comments to me. Let me know off the hook. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. You know, I say my opinion also, and I, I'm, I'm still stick to my opinion that some vendors are wrong. And yeah, to your point, like some decisions are taken wrong sometimes also as well. So nevertheless, Richard, like, you know, that really time flew, I would say, like it's, it was very, very intense, very fast, but yet very informative, you know, episode today with you. I really appreciate, you know, all their insights and all your experience that you brought today. And I will make sure that I will put, you know, all the links. You want to say something? No, or just to thank, to thank you again. I mean, I enjoyed it. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity and I really appreciate the show. Thanks again. Keep up the good work, uh, but thank you for having me. My, my pleasure. And guys, like, again, if you have any questions, I would be putting, you know, like uh, there is a, a, if you go to Spotify, you know, you can see, um, you know, a question and answer section there and your feedback, you can write it there also as well. Although the podcast is available on all podcasting platforms, you can reach out to me by email or LinkedIn where I'm most active. I'll make sure, you know, the links that Richard mentioned, they are also in the show notes. So you can go there and uh, check them. And again, thank you for tuning in and we'll meet again in the next episode. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Hit that subscribe button. Share the show with your tech-savvy friends and fellow entrepreneurs. And leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Your support means the world to us.